About a month ago, I was watching Saffron Olive navigate another one of his outlandish against the odds decks in Modern, and like most of his brews, this one revolved around one stipulation, the Planeswalker Soren Markov. Nearly every card in the deck contained Soren in the artwork or card name, and every one of his Planeswalker iterations was included to top out the curve. The deck was janky and absurd, and somehow pretty competitive. At a certain point, in true against the odds fashion, this happened. Alright, we're going for it. Sorentron! We are going to assemble Sorentron. So play Big Sorin. <laughs> Kill Restoration Angel. Make a vampire. Make a vampire. Pass the dirt. Opponent. Plenty of God opponent. I think I think we might be good now. It got me thinking on a meta level about the suspension of disbelief in magic. To be honest, I actually got kind of mad seeing all these damn Sorens in play at the same time, which of course was the point of the deck. Perhaps it felt like watching Magic jump the shark a little bit. The very recent rules change to allow multiple versions of the same Planeswalker in play made this deck idea and others like it possible. Jace Tribal operates on a similar axis, for example. Watching Seth assemble Sorentron also cast my memory back to another era and reminded me of one of the game's most unique cards. Printed in the middle sets of the Kamigawa block, Mirror Gallery is one of only two cards that explicitly refer to the game's rulebook in their text box. More specifically, it pinpoints Rule 704.5J, formerly catalogued as 704.5K, and colloquially known as the Legend Rule. The thing is, when Mirror Gallery was printed, that rule looked very different than it does now. Which led me to another question. How long until this card does nothing at all? Let's start with a little history. Rule 704.5K debuted early in Magic's development with its third expansion, Legends. As the name suggests, this set was the first time that the legendary subtype appeared on cards, which signified both a more powerful, unique character or location in the game world, as well as a rules limitation to allow for their pushed abilities. In its first iteration, the legend rule went beyond the battlefield and restricted a player to only one copy of a legendary permanent in their entire deck. Flavorfully, this made sense. The cards represented individual named entities within the mythos, so how could you have more than one at your disposal? However, this set up functional difficulties and limited players in their builds. So in 1995, R&D removed the restriction and allowed players the maximum set of four copies to include in their deck. On the battlefields though, the legend rule stated that only one copy of a legendary permanent of the same name was permitted to exist on either side of the table at a time. If an opponent cast Nicol Bolas, for example, while one was in your hand, tough luck. Casting yours would just send it straight to the graveyard, so it virtually acted as a dead draw. This was the most extreme version of 704.5k, and it all came to a head with the dominance of rebel decks during the Mercadian Masks block in 1999. Lynn Sivy defiant hero was the culprit. In rebel mirror matches, the first to put her on the battlefield would oftentimes run away with the game. So in 2004, after much debate between members within R&D, the legend rule saw its first reworking. The first update applied to the type lines of legendary permanence. During the first 10 years, legend was a subtype on creatures to coincide with the old naming format. With Champions of Kamigawa, legendary creature instead became a super type, which retroactively left many of the older legends without a creature type at all. It also closed a loophole created by the card Unnatural Selection. Under the old rules, players could choose legend with this card's activated ability and effectively destroy any creature on the battlefields that showed up in duplicates. More importantly for research and development, it allowed the team to push legendary design again without fear of repeating the Lin Sivi debacle, making way for aggressively costed creatures like the game's first 1-mana 2-2. In order to compensate for the Hound's push stats, the rules committee reworked the original restriction. Inspired by a eureka moment by Zvi Mauschewitz at Pro Tour Venice, Legend Rule 2.0 stated, If two or more permanents with the same name have the supertype Legendary, all are put into their owner's graveyards. This is called the Legend Rule. If only one of those permanents is Legendary, this rule doesn't apply. No longer would multiple Nicol Boluses rot in your hand. Now you could cast your Legendary creatures to destroy those of your opponents. Wait, what? Right. Legends henceforth effectively doubled as both individually powerful cards, as well as removal spells that, very importantly, did not need to target to destroy their opposing counterparts. And here is where I will pause for just a second. At the heart of the legend rule lies the ongoing tension between flavor and function. I explored this paradigm in my video on card frames. 
and I'd like to use it once again as a method for analysis here. Because the rules change in 2004, in my eyes, made little sense from the perspective of either field. Here's what I mean. Let's start with function. Once the new legend rule was implemented in the Kamigawa block, there was a shift in gameplay at the top tournament tables. Prior to this shift, as best expressed by the Rebel Deck Mirror matches, players tended towards playing their threats proactively. The punishment pre-2004 was being conservative with your legendary permanents, since doing so turned them into blanks in your hand. After Kamigawa though, aggressive decks suffered, and players who exercised a little bit of patience could oftentimes emerge with a significant tempo advantage if their opponents became too ambitious. Imagine, for example, being on the draw in the mono-white mirror match. Your opponent plays his Isamaru on turn 1, because that's what his deck wants to do. You do the same, except yours doubles as a murder for 1 mana. So not only were legends pushed, but they also gained hidden text. To recall that old drafting acronym BREAD, legends could double as both bombs and removal in the right situations. Another result, then, was that tournament players started including the most played legendary creatures into their sideboards for the sole purpose of destroying their opponent's game plan regardless if that creature was effective at all in the core shell of their deck. And that's just an oblivion ring for guys to say track. Yes. I think the most problematic expression of this shift in functionality caused by the reworked legend rule took shape during Innistrad Standard during which Geist of St. Traft doubled as a win condition and a kill spell. Geist, Geist. Away they go. Or, as Nate explained it back in 2013, In Game 2, Stern summoned the one and only legendary Geist of St. Traft, and though it was protected by a hexproof force field, Utter Layton got rid of the Geist by summoning his own one and only legendary Geist, which, upon seeing itself on Stern's side of the battlefield as well, caused a rift in the space-time continuum such that both Geists disappeared. Then Stern re-summoned the Geist, and with the same paradox, Utter Layton vanished it yet again. Vendillion Click was also a culprit of exploiting the legend rule, as reactive blue players could kill opposing clicks and still receive the enter the battlefield effect as a bonus. Now the reason they're going to place it in the graveyard, uh, Vendillion Click, even though it's a 3 mana 3 1, is actually a legend. Yes, it's not Vendillion, comma, the click, <laughs> which is how you would often think of it as being a legendary, but yep. The legend rule, as soon as you, they see each other, it's like, eek, something wrong with the temporal rift, out of here. And Phantasmal Image became an unstoppable sideboard card in any deck with blue for the same reason. At only two mana, it could copy any legend, including the two most notorious creatures with Hexproof in Geist of St. Traft and Thrun the Last Troll. And Phantasmal Image Necrotals the Thrun, Thrun the Last Troll. So all of these wacky gameplay interactions culminated in a second change of Rule 704.5k in the summer of 2013. The new rulings fixed the functional flaw of the 2004 iteration, namely by removing the hidden kill spell components built into every legendary card, but they left Flavor in an even stranger spot than before. Up until that point, Flavor was the reason for the existence of the rule in the first place, but once Function took over design philosophy, it shifted the paradigm into unbalanced territory. Once again, Nate said it best. This is like really weird, right? Rosewater. Only he and his minions are powerful enough to alter the rule of legends. Just go with it. Just go with it is what we learned to do. The new legend rule essentially divided the play space in half, which meant that it only checked for two or more copies of any legendary permanent under the control of the same owner. No longer could clones like Phantasmal Image act as quote-unquote situational killing machines. However, this meant that two Geists could battle against one another without opening another rift in the space-time continuum. This was immediately seen as a huge flavor fail. But let's take a step back for a second and really assess what is going on in a normal game of Magic. Over the years, I've learned that arguing in favor of flavor quickly devolves into a circular loop of logic that can never really stand on its own. On one hand, the game maintains a certain level of coherence within its context. It is acceptable to suspend disbelief, but only to an extent. It's not a stretch to imagine being all-powerful, wizard-like entities that summon spells and use magic to do our bidding. Yeah, in the macro, that works. But zooming into the specifics, the game very quickly becomes so absurd that it's hard to maintain that illusion, and furthermore rely upon it to dictate design. If you really think about it, the third version of Rule 704.5k that allowed two geists to look at one another is quite tame to what often happens in Magic. 
This became clear to me a couple of years ago while listening to Jason Alt's riff on Brainstorm Brewery about the disjunction created by having Kaladesh and Innistrad in the same block, leaving me in stitches in the process. And how could those sets even work together? It's like, well, I'm from a plane where it's 1532 Germany and we got pitchforks and what the fuck is that? Oh, it's a smuggler's copter. Would you like to crew this? And then it crashes because they don't understand arithmetic because they're farmers. You can't have a creature from Innistrad block flying a fucking copter around. I don't get that flavor wise. Is that what you want crewing your flying vehicle? Yeah, it is a sound argument that Nicol Bolas should be a unique game piece. There is only one of him after all. But when you ask me to take this a step further and entertain the idea of a giant dragon wearing boots and wielding three swords despite having only two arms, and that such an almighty beast cannot succumb to the resolve of a lone dove void of magical powers, well... I suppose it is fair to say that this is an element inherent to all fantasy games, not just magic. The best role-playing moments in D&D do tend to stem from the dissolve of disbelief and the hilarity that ensues. We can craft our best shared memories together when we're forced to imagine that dragon wearing boots and exhausting himself on a pigeon. I'm not arguing in favor of ignoring flavor altogether, rather I think magic is a game with so many tiny moving parts that each piece has a limit to its believability. Arguing in favor of flavor for maintaining on a macro scale, said believability is ultimately flawed though. It goes in circles. So what would happen if we were to eliminate rule 704.5k altogether? What if we turned mirror gallery into the rule? Well, I asked Twitter, and it seems like this is not an option. But I want to entertain the idea anyway. So I searched up all the cards with legendary in their text to see how they would be affected. At this point, there are just over 1,000 cards in the game's history that would change with a mirror gallery rules reworking. The most immediate and almost entirely uniform effect would be an increase in power level to all these legendary cards. What emerges, therefore, is that the legendary super type really is just a mechanic that allows R&D to make stronger cards. Story and flavor become an added bonus that complete the package. This is because the majority of legendary creatures just evolve into nearly broken game pieces without 704.5k. Multiple Azusas would be a green player's paradise. Double Talrand would assemble an unstoppable air force, not that he needs much help anyway, and I bet having access to two or three Leovolds at the same time would make vintage hearts tingle with value. A couple of cards though would be significantly nerfed without the rule. Because of the change in 2013, the Dark Depths and Thespian Stage combo became possible and started showing up in Eternal formats, allowing players to choose which copy of a legendary permanent to keep when multiples are in play at the same time meant that you could forego waiting for the ice to melt to summon Merit Lodge. And of course, the Commander crowd would have to find new stipulations for deck building. Rather than a drawback, the legendary supertype is oftentimes a huge boon for EDH. Players have been clamoring for an errata on cards like Chromanticore and the Nephilim since their printing to be upgraded to Legendary. Because of the format's gigantic popularity, it is no surprise that Wizards has doubled down on printing Legendary creatures and supplemental support for the supertype. As exemplified by the Dominaria expansion, which added 64 new Legendary cards to the pool, a new spiffy frame to help these cards stand out, and even the first attempt at Legendary sorceries, it is safe to say that this rule isn't going anywhere. The advent of the Brawl format solidifies such a claim. But I would like to invite you all to think of 704.5k more as a mechanic than a game rule, especially when trying to argue for its preservation from the perspective of flavor. Because in 2018, 704.5k became 704.5j, melding with the former Planeswalker uniqueness rule and lending way to the existence of decks like Sorentron. No, three Sorens in play does not make any sense, but three unique game pieces certainly does. And if we look towards fighting games like Mortal Kombat for a parallel, a mirror match between two identical characters actually opens up design space and nuance in tournaments. In watching two reptiles battle head to head, we are forced to suspend disbelief in a slightly different manner. Thus, after a long study on the legend rule, I'm convinced it's in a perfect spot. I hope it stays there. Long live Mirror Gallery.